let's continue talking about stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. But let's focus on some ways that we can reduce these problems. Specifically, we'll talk about some social psychological solutions that are based on intergroup contact. When we talk about intergroup contact, we're focusing on one key question. Will more contact between racial groups reduce prejudice between those groups? Seems like a very logical question. Think about how things were when racial segregation was very prominent in our society. You can see there's nothing about that situation right there that encourages healthy interaction between the races. In a perfect world, we're looking for a situation like this one right here, where we see diverse groups of people, people from a variety of different backgrounds, who genuinely like each other's company, and they're able to work together and learn together and achieve shared goals together. So, bottom line question, will more contact between races help reduce prejudice between those two races? So it seemed like something that was really worth pursuing, particularly because in the 1950s, there were a couple key things that happened that pushed finding an answer to that question. One was an important Supreme Court decision in the case of Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka. And what the Supreme Court found was racially segregated schools were inherently unequal. And because they were inherently unequal, they were unconstitutional. So essentially, school districts around the country had to desegregate. And as a result of that Supreme Court decision, there were now going to be examples of schools in which there was going to be much more interaction between kids of different races. Now, right along at the same time, Gordon Alport published a very influential book in psychology. It was called The Nature of Prejudice. And he talked about a lot of really important things in that book. But one thing that was related to this situation was the contact hypothesis. The contact hypothesis simply stated that direct contact between hostile groups will reduce intergroup prejudice, but only under certain conditions. And this really turned out to be an important detail. So we're going to talk about those specific situations soon. But the problem is, even though the schools were desegregating, some of those really important conditions were not met. So that when the two groups got together, there really was not necessarily a reduction in prejudice. And overall, school desegregation didn't really have the intended effects that we all wanted. What many school districts saw is depicted in this picture right here where although we had kids of different racial groups within the same schools, the kids within the racial groups still tended to hang out with each other and each other only. So in some ways, it seemed like the contact hypothesis was wrong, and that contact between the races would not reduce prejudice. But remember I said it only works under certain conditions. And researchers got savvy, and they decided to look around because not all school districts are the same. And they realized that some school districts did have a lot of promising results. And they wanted to see what was it about those school districts? What did they do that led to success? They found that in those schools, contact was effective for reducing prejudice when four basic conditions were met. Let's talk about those four basic conditions next. So when these four conditions are met, then intergroup contact will essentially serve as a treatment for prejudice and racism. The first seems pretty obvious. We need to have equal status. So the groups have to come together within an environment in which they're all treated equally and with respect. And of course, that's not how things were when we talk about the era of segregation that our country has seen in the past. So this is what we're looking for. We're looking for a situation in which kids of different racial groups are coming together in a situation where they all have equal status. They all have equal rights. So you see in this picture, kids of different racial groups they all have equal access to the same types of instructors, the same types of classrooms, and more importantly, they have access to each other. And that brings us to the second important condition. There needs to be contact between the members of the different groups. Well, those first two conditions are really important for setting up an environment in which the kids can learn, in which they all have equal opportunities. But we can go beyond that. The third condition is that you wanna create some cooperative activities. You want to set up a situation in which the members of the groups need to come together to achieve some type of superordinate goals. And we've talked about superordinate goals previously. Remember, superordinate goals are goals that can only be achieved when different groups come together and they work cooperatively. So it doesn't always need to be something academic. In this type of situation, you see some kids coming together to work on an art project, and each one is making contributions. 
when each one makes contributions together and only together are they able to achieve their shared goal. It's easy to see how successful this can be when you talk about sports teams. Look at these guys right here. They love football and they love football so much they're able to put aside whatever differences they had previously about different racial groups so that they can work together as a team. And as they do that, they really come to appreciate each other because they realize the skills and the abilities that each one brings with them. And because they share these experiences together, they're able to really bond as a unit, as a group of friends. This right here is a picture of uh, some girls playing basketball. This is a league of Arabs and Jews. Now it's important to note it's not Arabs playing against Jews, it's Arabs and Jews playing together on these teams. Remember, when we're talking about intergroup contact, what's really key is fostering cooperation. It's competition that often breeds contempt between two groups, so we want to avoid that as much as possible. The final condition that's important is creating social norms that favor racial harmony and intergroup contact. And norms are usually established from the top down. So in a school type environment like this, we need to make sure that the teachers and the administrators are all on board. They have to support the idea of reducing racial prejudice and they can't have any tolerance at all for any type of bigotry. The more of these conditions that are met, the higher the likelihood that intergroup contact is going to reduce prejudice and discrimination. Well, how does it work? What's actually going on? Well, that direct contact will reduce prejudice by a variety of factors. One is simply by enhancing knowledge about the outgroup. In other words, by having contact with people of another group, they come to know each other better. Once they get to know each other, they no longer have that same anxiety that typically goes along with meeting someone from another group. In other words, their social interactions are no longer as awkward as they would have been otherwise. As they come to know each other better, and as they feel less anxious interacting with one another, they develop a better sense of empathy and perspective taking. They get to understand how the other group thinks and how they feel. They're starting to see them more as human beings. Let's wrap up this discussion by talking about the Jigsaw Classroom. The Jigsaw Classroom is based on principles of intergroup contact. If you think about most classrooms, they foster competition. And we know that competition isn't good when we're talking about different groups of people because competition between groups tends to breed hostility between those groups. So the Jigsaw Classroom is different. It features a cooperative learning environment. And the method that is used is designed to reduce racial prejudice through direct interactions in group efforts. Let me explain what that means. It essentially means the kids are coming together in small groups and they're teaching each other material. So they have this group effort to learn the material and they all need to rely on one another. So the bottom line is, in a jigsaw classroom, the kids need to rely on each other to learn the material. Let me give you a sense of how that might work in our own classroom. Let's say we took everybody in our own classroom and then we divided them up into groups of four. And let's assume that we've got racially diverse groups. That's the whole point because we want kids of different groups working together. So let's say we're trying to learn about stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. So within each group, everybody's gonna have their own responsibilities. So let's say that this student right here is gonna be responsible for learning about stereotypes. This student's gonna be responsible for learning about prejudice, this one about discrimination, and this student's gonna be responsible for learning how do all those factors interact? How do they come together? So once we decide who's responsible for what, each individual kid is gonna to get together with kids from other groups who have the same responsibilities. And then those kids are gonna learn the material and become the experts. They're then gonna come back to their original group and they're gonna teach the other group members about the specific content that they learned. The thing that makes this interesting is that every student is a learner, but every student is also a teacher. And in order for each group to be successful, they have to rely on each group member to do their part. And you've probably noticed this, that when you have to teach material, you really learn the material. So it's good for the students. It's also good because the other students get to look to the students who are teaching and they see them in a new light. The hope is that they develop a new respect for them because they see them as capable human beings who can teach them something. Well, jigsaw classrooms tend to be pretty effective. It tends to lead students to like school more, they like each other more, and they also develop a better sense of self-esteem. And when it comes to test scores, those scores tend to improve for minority students.
So Jigsaw Classrooms really do a great job of putting the ideas of intergroup contact into action. It's really a great example of a social psychological solution to a real world problem. All right, well, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon.